Thank you. I'm looking forward to this. Um, we only have a short period of time here, so we're going to go ahead and dive right in. Um, as Henrik mentioned, um, I have a number of roles. I happen to, I work for a software vendor called AppGate, uh, and we make a zero trust security platform, uh, but I'm not here to promote that or to, to put that hat on. Really, I'm here as a uh, participant in the industry. Uh, one of my roles is that I'm one of the co-chairs of the Software Defined Perimeter Zero Trust Working Group with the Cloud Security Alliance. Uh, and in that role, I work with folks across the industry to help publish uh, research papers to advance knowledge and best practices around zero trust uh, and the open architecture called the Software Defined Perimeter. I also recently wrote a book called Zero Trust Security and Enterprise Guide, which provides a uh, historical and current analysis of zero trust and then looking at it from the lens of enterprise architectures and explaining how this trend in the industry called zero trust um, can and should be interpreted and applied by enterprises. Um, I'll let you know up front, I'm not an incident response uh, expert by any means. So everyone in the audience knows more about incident response than I do. Um, and what I'm gonna be doing in this presentation is talking about zero trust, giving you some perspective on what it is, why we're here, and hopefully um, to give you some encouragement for the enterprises that you're working with or working for to have them adopt and embrace zero trust. And then we'll look at it through the, the standard model of the incident response phases to try to understand how a zero trust enterprise and an enterprise architecture could be different in uh, from an incident response perspective. Um, this is definitely the beginning of what I hope will be a really good conversation from the incident response community for using and working in zero trust environments. Uh, so let's go ahead and dive right in here. Uh, so first some bad news, um, and this is not really gonna be news, maybe it's just bad, but <laughs> the reality in our world that all of you know that we all live in every day is that we live in a very complex and very highly different, uh, very differentiated IT infrastructure uh, landscape compared to 10 or 15 years ago. Um, if you just look at how applications are being built, how businesses are running today, there's a huge adoption of fantastically powerful and amazing platforms from infrastructure and platform as a service for virtualization, containerized workloads, service meshes, et cetera. Um, however, what this has done is with all the power it's brought <clears throat> has, has brought uh, an increase in complexity. And I think that it's very fair to say that the security tools and the networking tools that we have to, to manage and model <clears throat> and control access across all those environments has really lagged behind and has without a doubt <clears throat> given us a very ineffective security platform. We only need to look at the headlines and the terrible breaches and incidents that are happening every single day because of a, a heightened threat landscape and the very advanced adversaries that we have out there uh, to, to reach the, the not too surprising conclusion that we really have to change things and uh, change the way that we're doing security. The reason, uh, my hypothesis is the reason that we're in this state is really that um, <clears throat> there's two, there's two, two things, you know, to some degree we're fighting with one or maybe even both hands behind our back, right? And ultimately our networking technology, TCP IP, as fantastic as it is, uh, is a weak security foundation. If you look at the history of this, when it was created in the 1970s, the folks who did this were, I have such amazing respect for what they created with such a limited um, compute abilities. Uh, they had to invent so much technology and standards along the way. And the end result was that TCP IP, TCP IP is a phenomenally successful protocol that's designed with this notion of complete implicit trust, which is fantastic. If you can send packets to a device across the network, TCP lets you very easily set up a network connection, gives you some level of reliability for communications, um, and then you can conduct business by communicating messages across that. And the way it works, of course, is that it operates under this connect first and authenticate second protocol. And everyone's familiar with TCP's three-way handshake of, uh, to, in order to establish a connection. And the way it works is that, number one, you can really see everything on the network. You can send an ICMP ping and get a response back. You can send a TCP SAN to it on an open port and you can get a response back. And that's giving you as a IT or a networking professional some great tools to be able to easily network your systems but it's also providing today far too much information and a, a very visible attack surface to our adversaries. So the result today is that our adversaries can see all the resources on our network, either 
at the entry point to our enterprise networks if they're remote or across our enterprise networks if they've established a foothold inside. Um, <clears throat> then there's some level of connection establishment. And then and only then is there some level of authentication that happens uh, typically at an application level. And I know there's some things that are built on top of TCP IP like 802.1x, uh, but at a basic networking level, you know, this is definitely true and it's definitely a weakness. So that's one, that's one weakness. <clears throat> and we can see this through our favorite search engine, Shodan, where you can go out and look for things like the RDP protocol. I did this the other day and there's approximately four and a half million RDP servers that it detected available worldwide. <clears throat> and that number of course should be zero, right? For goodness sake, don't do this. Uh, don't expose RDP on your networks and don't expose, for goodness sakes, your Windows login screen or even worse, uh, a Windows Server 2003 login screen that's publicly available. Uh, so number one, TCP IP doesn't give us any notion of security because it's default uh, implicit trust and default open. Second is that TCP IP, and this is really, even in today's most advanced cloud environments, you look at infrastructure as a service environments, the network security groups or the security groups that they provide um, really have to fall back on this very impoverished policy language for expressing access control. Um, and that language is really just, should this source IP address over here have access to this target IP address or subnet over here? And it gives you the ability to say yes or no, allow or block. And the reality is that this is a terrible policy model because IP addresses aren't identities. We know nothing about IP addresses. They change, they're shared, and there's no context whatsoever to make this informed decision about whether or not this, uh, this uh, source IP address should be allowed to connect to this. And the end result of this is that um, security teams often give up. They say, look, I have no idea because I've got 5,000 users that are VPNing in and they all get the same NAT of IP address, or I've got you know, 5,000 users on my internal network and they have DHCP and I don't really know who they are. And as they go across the WAN, uh, their IP address gets anonymized and I can't disambiguate anymore. I'm gonna give up and I have to support the business. So we're just gonna have a big open network. Maybe we'll have a couple of VLANs like a production and employee VLAN. And we're gonna rely on authentication for access control. And the end result of that is terrible because as we know, authentication is not sufficient for protecting our services. And there are far too many exploits that are unpatched and well publicized uh, for which authentication isn't even necessary. All an attacker needs is the ability to send network packets to a target server. They can exploit some vulnerability and then they're, uh, they're into the network and they're, they're on their way. So the solution to this is this concept of zero trust. And zero trust as a philosophy has some principles in mind. And what the goals of this are, number one, is to compensate for the weaknesses of our, the inherent weaknesses of our implicit trust network. And what zero trust says is no, we're gonna require uh, some level of authentication first before you're actually allowed to establish a network connection. Uh, and we do this by reversing this, by turning this, this, uh, this process on its head and saying, systems have to authenticate. And there's a variety of means that they can authenticate. And we'll talk about that uh, a little bit later, but only after they've authenticated are they actually allowed to establish a network connection. And then of course, they can only see the set of resources that are authorized for them. So what this implies is, of course, there's some sort of identity system and mechanism for authenticating these individuals or these identities if they're non-humans. Um, and then two, there's a policy model or an authorization model that says, given what we know about this identity, here are the set of resources that they're allowed to access at this point in time. Now, the beauty of this system is that it also makes the system resilient to denial of service attacks. Because if you think about this, that if it's done properly, the mechanism and the computational load for authenticating these identities is gonna be far, far less than the, the work and a computational load necessary to actually establish a TCP or a TLS connection and then perform some level, level of application authentication. So it makes the networks much more resilient, assuming that you do it right. Um, so that's the first piece of this. The second piece of it is that zero trust enables a much richer, and I would argue far, far more useful policy language for expressing uh, authorization. And the policy language that a zero trust system uh, pr presents to us is the ability to ask a question like this. Well, should Jim have access to our production SAP server? Okay, that's a really interesting question. And it's actually meaningful to a lot of people across the business. 
we know Jim. Jim has an identity. Jim has a role in the company. And maybe Jim does, should or shouldn't have access to the production server, but we're not talking about an IP address here. So that's a meaningful question. And the other half of it is, this is our SAP production server. So now we know, okay, this is production data. It's probably got to be protected. Maybe it should only be accessible to people on the finance team, et cetera. Um, that's a really meaningful question that you can build some interesting sets of policies and controls around. Second, the answer to the question that zero trust enables is in fact, it depends. And that's of course always, always the right answer to any interesting question. And what does it depend on? Well, it depends on a lot of really interesting uh, additional elements. And these are exactly the ingredients, if you will, that zero trust enables in a policy model. So now imagine a world where you can say, fantastic, I know that this is a production system. I'm gonna set up a policy that says, in order to access the user interface to use our, our uh, financial system, this person needs to be on the finance team in our group, in our directory system. They need to authenticate. If they're remote, they need to use MFA. If they're local, maybe that they don't. Um, they need to make sure that their system, their local device is patched and up to date according to our database. Um, maybe it's the type of job or function where we really only want them to connect during typical business hours. Um, these are all really useful ingredients to have in a policy that are impossible to express with traditional networking uh, technologies. So those are kind of the ingredients of where we, where we wanna get to. So we think about what zero trust is. <clears throat> so zero trust is a security philosophy that's happened in the market in the last five to seven years. And in the last year, it's really taken significant uh, prominence and um, visibility in the market, which is great. There's a downside, which has also become a buzzword, and there's a lot of vendor hype around that. Um, but ultimately, there's some real substance behind this. And if we think about what the United States National Institute uh, of Standards and Technology, or NIST, says, is that this is a set of cybersecurity paradigms that move defenses from tr our traditional static and network-based perimeters, or I would say perimeter-based networks, um, and instead focus on users, assets, and resources. So really identity-centric, uh, identity an identity-centric model. And those identities, of course, can be humans as well as non-person entities. A couple of weeks ago, President Biden of the US issued an executive order around uh, <clears throat> a prioritization and investment in uh, federal agencies around cybersecurity. And one element of this was mandating zero trust. Um, and in this, <clears throat> in this order, they define zero trust as something that eliminates implicit trust in any one element mode or service and instead requires continuous verification, and that's important, of <clears throat> the operational picture via real-time information from multiple sources to determine access and other system responses. So the key elements of this are continuous as opposed to static and the fact that this thing is synthesizing information from a variety of sources. And we'll see that in the next on the next slide with the diagram. Ultimately, if you look at what NIST is saying is uh, they list a number of of tenets in their, in their document, uh, which is very highly readable, I recommend it. But the core elements of, our, of these are these four bullet points here, which are first that all communications is secured regardless of network location. And that's not just data in motion in terms of encryption, but ensuring that there's a model around uh, controlling access for all identities, all users to all resources, regardless of where the user is, regardless of what network they're communicating over, and regardless of where the workload is operating. Second, that there is a dynamic policy model that is enforce, that enforces authorization. Um, and dynamic is an important piece of it uh, because you get to the third bullet point and they talk about how all authentication and authorization is dynamic and strictly enforced before access is allowed. So this is the principle of least privilege, <clears throat> which harkens back to the, let's make sure that all unauthorized resources are invisible on the network. And then finally, <clears throat> there needs to be some monitoring, some enriched capabilities to look at what's happening on the network and the ability to, to dive into and look at the security posture of the assets. Um, Zero Trust is not an architecture. It's a um, approach and philosophy and these set of principles and it maps to a variety of architectural uh, implementations. <clears throat> um, so let's take a look at, uh, at some of those. So this document shows at a high level, the concepts of zero trust from the NIST document. You can see there's some key elements here. So the first is there's this thing at the top called the policy decision point or PDP, 
Um, and that's the brain, if you will. And that communicates with a set of policy enforcement points through a control plane. So the first of all is very classic separation of the control plane and the data plane that we've seen across other industry paradigms. Second is that the subject, which utilizes some computer system, of course, um, can only access the enterprise resource by going through a policy enforcement point. And the policy enforcement point is the one that, like its name uh, implies, enforces the policies that are given to it by the policy decision point. And there's also some authentication that has to happen for the subject. And I'll, I'll illustrate that in the next slide. The boxes on, the, on either side of the diagram are really, really important. Those are shown as logical inputs into the zero trust system. And you can imagine there's eight there, but that's just a sample, a complete enumeration of the rest of the elements of your enterprise ecosystem. I mean, clearly a policy decision point in order to make identity and contact sensitive decisions about should this subject, should this identity have access to this resource over here, needs to look at the identity management system or the PKI system, if they're looking at that, probably understanding what's going on in the environment by getting information from a SIM, probably getting some information from a threat intelligence system, uh, certainly a continuous diagnostics and monitoring system, uh, probably also a CMDB to get some visibility into this. So all these things become input into the, uh, the policy decision point. So it can then make continuous decisions about should this resource get access to the system over here to begin with? And if something changes in the environment, maybe we need to revoke that access or maybe we need to enforce step up authentication for the user. So if we look at um, <clears throat> the NIST document outlines actually four deployment models. And we're just gonna focus on one today uh, in the interest of time. And this one is called uh, the Enclave based deployment model. Um, this also happens to be the model that seems to have uh, I would say have the predominant or very common uh, usage or a support in uh, open source and commercial implementations in the marketplace, in particular around the software defined perimeter. And the idea is that you've got a usually an agent, uh, a local policy enforcement point that runs on the user's device. You have a policy enforcement point that acts as a network gateway and sits in front of the protected resources. <clears throat> Uh, both those systems will integrate with and talk to the policy decision point uh, to, for the subject's case, to authenticate the user and for the, uh, for the, the PEP's case, to get information about uh, what policies are allowed and to, uh, to be in constant touch for real-time changes. Um, and then the communication goes from the subject's device across some sort of secure logical channel through the policy enforcement point to the target resource um, that sits in some resource enclave. And the beauty of this is that because the PEP is managing the traffic, it has the ability to, of course, block it. Uh, it has the ability to influence and affect change on the user's device, such as prompting for step up authentication. And it has the ability to interrogate the target resource environment for changes, such as, hey, a new resource has appeared with these attributes, so we're gonna allow or disallow access based on, uh, based on the attributes. Okay, so, I'm going to very briefly give you a, an example of this, and then we'll shift gears and talk about uh, this from an incident response perspective. Um, so imagine we have an enterprise that has deployed a zero trust model uh, and has the attributes that we've talked about. And we'll start with our favorite employee, Sally, uh, who is director of finance. Um, so she wakes up in the morning and gets her first cup of coffee or tea and um, turns on her device and starts to do her work. And the first thing that happens is the device validates, the zero trust agent on the device validates that, hey, this device has a properly uh, proper certificate that was issued by the corporate CA that's in, let's say, uh, some sort of hardware, uh, hardware security module. Um, based on that, the zero trust system says, okay, now we're ready to connect to the network and it allows Sally to access some um, cloud-based email uh, but because she's not in an office building, it's going to prompt her for some sort of multi-factor authentication. And Sally doesn't mind because it just does something modern, like you know, pushes a pushes a notification to her phone, and she presses yes on an authenticator app of some sort. Um, she also has secure access into some on-premises resources. In this case, uh, file share. So she downloads a presentation uh, that she needs to look at for today. But Sally makes a mistake, clicks on a phishing link in email and uh, get some malware installed on her device. Um, after that, she goes to the office, uh, plugs into the network there, uh, or gets on the corporate Wi-Fi, and again, does her job. What happens is the zero trust system would recognize that she has roamed, and now she's on a different network. It goes through some further validation behind the scenes for her, 
but says, okay, everything's still good with the device. We're on the corporate network. She can access these department applications and do her job. But what happens is the malware also wakes up and the malware attempts to do some port scans uh, across the network. And because this is a zero trust system and because everything operates in a default deny mode, first of all, those port scans are blocked. And second of all, they are, uh, they are detected very easily because there's much less noise in the system. So the security system says, hey, this is unauthorized. It notifies IT, it notifies the SOC, and it can also either in an automated fashion or manual fashion, um, quarantine her device and says, okay, something is up here. This thing is attempting to do things that Sally never does. We're gonna block it from the network. Maybe we'll send Sally a text message or call her up uh, and prevent the malware from spreading on the network. Uh, and finally, um, let's say the security team has said, okay, we need to have uh, our IT administrator connect to Sally's device to, uh, to remove the malware or to re-image it or whatever. Um, in this case, what they're doing is they're utilizing the capability of a zero trust system to integrate with a business process, in this case, the service desk. So they follow their normal process of creating the service desk ticket. Um, the IT administrator, because there's an open ticket, now has the ability to establish this network connection to Sally's device. And what the beauty of this is that Bob, who could possibly have malware in his device as well, doesn't have unlimited 24 by seven access to everyone's device. It's only controlled, it's only allowed if there's a service desk ticket that's in the open state. And the service desk ticket is another ingredient into the zero trust systems policy decision point. Because that ticket is open, Bob can actually establish the connection to Sally's device. He logs in, he does what he needs to do to clean it up, and then he closes the ticket. Um, and then Bob's ability to connect goes away. Once the ticket is closed and the security system has basically been reset and says, okay, Sally's device is now clean, then she can reestablish the connection. She'll probably be prompted for MFA and then she can be fully productive again. Very simple example, but it shows some of the flows here and uh, the capabilities. So let's look at this from an IR perspective. Clearly, everyone on the call here is familiar with these, uh, with these six phases. Um, what we're gonna do is walk through each of these and try to look at it from uh, how a zero trust enterprise would have a different uh, perspective or different experience or a different set of capabilities for this. Um, our premise here is that the enterprise has some sort of zero trust system deployed and we can assume it uses a model very similar to what we talked about in uh, this enclave based model that they've got it working in whoops, uh, reasonably good operational form. Uh, they have good authentication methods and well understood identity providers. Um, they have multi-factor authentication in place for hopefully all users, but at least most users. Um, and they have some level of integration, uh, automated integration between the zero trust and infrastructure and their security and IT system. So feeding information that's enriched up to the SIM, for example, and the ability to respond to events from a SOC and tie into maybe a service desk like we mentioned. Um, so let's, let's take a look. <clears throat> so in the prepare phase, I think you know, clearly there's some basic steps that IR folks all do uh, shown on the, on the left side. And in a zero trust world, what we would recommend is looking at a zero trust deployment from an IR uh, perspective is, first of all, <clears throat> make sure that you have policy enforcement points that are distributed across the network to get uh, those trust zones um, as small as possible. So if you go back for a second, the idea here is you have this resource enclave. So try to have that as small as possible. So there is little, there's um, as little as possible communication between these resources here that's outside uh, the view of the policy enforcement point. Um, this is often referred to as micro segmentation, for example. Um, you definitely wanna have mechanisms to have either, uh, either manually or ideally automated for enforcing step up authentication when various things happen, such as when someone's accessing a particular high value resource or when maybe uh, in a, a indication of compromise or something happens where something's out of the ordinary so that the system can very easily and automatically enforce step up authentication for a given user or for a group of users who might be accessing a particular uh, resource. You definitely wanna have some device posture checks that become uh, additional input into the zero trust policy decision point. Um, and you have the ability to um, define uh, network access based on different types of devices, uh, such as 
uh, for example, only allowing mobile operating system devices to access some types of resources, but not others. Um, you definitely want to have integrations with an endpoint management systems and a SIM and a SOC. Those are also great inputs into the zero trust policy model, either from a device attribute perspective for, let's say, the endpoint system or from an event perspective. Um, and then you want to have some instrumentation in place so that the zero trust agents and the policy enforcement points could also be feeding information up to uh, a SIM or a monitoring uh, system. Okay. So that's definitely good practice to prepare uh, from a zero trust perspective. If we look at when uh, we're in the identify phase, um, zero trust, as we mentioned, because it operates in a default deny mode, dramatically improves the signal to noise ratio. Um, so in theory, if a quote unquote all access should only be allowed, uh, should only be occurring for authorized resources that have policies that are evaluated positively and assigned to a user. Now, that often tends to be a little bit more of an end state because in many cases, organizations don't want to lock everything down, but it's definitely going to block uh, significant chunks of access, such as someone in the finance team should never be allowed to SSH to anything. That's simply you know, not in their job description. It's not in their skill set. And there's no reason whatsoever not to block all SSH access attempts from people on the finance team. Now, likewise, you should have very strict control around who's allowed to access any production servers. Um, the Zero Trust system also provides identity and rich log and activity data. And this is a real challenge in many cases when you have complex wide area networks with lots of network address translation, or you have people VPNing in. And there's oftentimes a difficult, it's difficult or impossible for a SIM to disambiguate activity on the network uh, from IP addresses. And because you have these in a zero trust world, these policy enforcement points across the network, they know exactly which identity is doing what. And that information can be fed into a SIM to make analysis and uh, SOC, uh, SOC analyst work a lot easier. The zero trust environment, uh, because it operates as an overlay across the network, gives teams the ability to find a single unified access control model across all those environments. And it really eliminates the difficulties of having siloed access control lists and models for a NAC versus a VPN versus a cloud environment versus a virtualized environment. And that significantly helps improve the efficiency and the effectiveness of people's understanding of what's going on in these environments. People don't have to say, okay, well, why is this thing accessing that? Well, I don't know, let's go check the ACL for that system. Well, who knows that, you know, it's George. Well, he's on vacation this week. Instead, everything's in one environment. So it's very much easier to find this stuff. Um, in addition, in the zero trust environment, in most situations, you have an on-device agent running on the user's device. And that can be used to provide additional telemetry. In some cases, it can perform activities. You can often download uh, custom scripts to that, et cetera. You know, with, of course, the caveat that if you're making an assumption that that device is compromised, you, know, you don't know exactly what's going on in the device. And maybe you take it with a little bit of a grain of salt. But it's certainly better than not having it. In a contain model, a contain phase, zero trust is great at this because clearly it has the ability to control exactly what access is happening on the network, both inbound and outbound. Um, so it's very easy to isolate these devices. Um, in many zero trust systems, you can literally say, all right, I wanna have this device and I'm gonna block all network traffic to and from it. And the only thing that it can communicate is now across that control plane. You can also do things that are a little bit more subtle like um, enforce step up authentication um, or enforce multiple factors of authentication, which is great to do in an out of band mode. So certainly if you consume, consider that a device might be um, compromised, you could easily say, okay, great. We're, we're not gonna have the user re-enter a password because there might be a key logger, but we're gonna push something to their phone, um, for example. You can also on the network side, much more easily quarantine uh, network zones and you know, do that in a way that's intelligent so that the impact on the business is known and uh, not disruptive, but increases your security. For example, you might say, well, geez, there's some malware that's going over SMB. We're going to block all SMB ports on the file shares. Okay, people won't be able to get to files. Yes, we understand that's going to impact their productivity, but it's stopping this malware from spreading. You can also perform pretty surgical isolation by device type or group or something like that. So for example, if you have a Windows piece of malware that you're considering that you're concerned is spreading, 
you can lock down all Windows devices, but leave other devices, other operating systems unaffected by, uh, by this. So it gives you the real precise control uh, in a way that's very dynamic as well. You can also, um, in a very advanced phase, um, even activate honeypots. You might say, huh, this device is trying to access this server over here. We're gonna flip the switch and then give the attacker on that device a very uh, distorted view of the network. And instead of pointing, someone, pointing them to our real systems, we'll point them to our honeypot systems. Same host name, same IP addresses, but they're actually different hosts. And um, that would be really interesting to see in action since it's, it's, a, it's a very advanced uh, uh, use case. In terms of eradication, Zero Trust can certainly help by offboarding any affected systems. You can decommission them, you can revoke certificates and access, et cetera. Um, and you can even completely uh, take identities off uh, their ability to, uh, to access. Um, this is a very simple step in terms of offboarding the system. Uh, Zero Trust doesn't directly help with, say, going in and cleaning up from malware from a file system or restoring from backups or things like that, although it can help in those worlds. And as always, remember, don't, don't trust the infected device. All right, I know we're, we're uh, gonna go about two or three minutes late, Henry. Um, it's okay, in, terms, in terms of recovery, um, clearly zero trust systems need to, because they operate at scale, because they're intended to really support ideally all users in an enterprise population, um, there will need to be some sort of mechanism for properly and securely onboarding new devices through some sort of trusted out-of-bound mechanism. And that's true whether or not you're recovering from an incident, of course. Um, so those are pretty standard steps. And um, as the threat level goes down, maybe an organization goes from red alert to yellow alert, that's gonna automatically adjust some of the, the security enforcement across the enterprise by maybe relaxing the level of MFA or the frequency of prompting for MSA, uh, MFA, et cetera. <clears throat> and then finally into in lessons learned, Zero Trust is helpful for giving very detailed um, audit logs of what actually happened. So you can see what devices connected to what, and that can help you understand the blast radius of a particular incident. It can also help you look at <clears throat> which sensors in the environment uh, and mechanisms that are in place did or didn't properly detect the indications of compromise. Uh, gives you visibility into trying to understand what sort of quarantine response the organization took and how effective it was, uh, looking also at alerting mechanisms and MFA mechanisms, and also gives you the opportunity to say, okay, we have this implicit trust zone here with you know, 50 servers in it, and now we need to invest in actually further micro-segmenting those so that those 50 servers don't have uh, unfettered network access to one another. Okay. So that's really the end of what I wanted to go through. I know that was pretty whirlwind in the short 30 minutes that we had, uh, but just to recap, we talked a little about why we're in the state we're in, uh, because we're really been hobbled by traditional networking and security architectures and technology, that zero trust is a security philosophy and approach that when properly implemented can significantly improve our enterprises resiliency and ability to protect themselves as well as make incident response teams a lot more uh, effective across the life cycle. Um, I, I'm a strong believer in zero trust. And I think that you know, we as security leaders have a real obligation to help push and pull our organizations to adopt this approach. The good news is that everyone in the industry is talking about it. You have the president of the United States talking about it for goodness sake. Um, so there's a lot of support for it in the industry. If you're interested in more uh, information, I definitely recommend taking a look at the NIST Zero Trust Architecture document shown in the lower left. That's what's called Special Publication 800-207. The United States Department of Defense also recently introduced a, a Zero Trust Reference Architecture there, uh, which is has a lot of specifications and mappings listed in there. But the most interesting part to me are some of the, uh, the reference components where they show uh, flow, logical flows uh, of how things connect to each other. The SDP Working Group in the Cloud Security Alliance has put together uh, the SDP specification, version one, version two is in peer review right now, and then the architecture guide, which I recommend. Um, and then from a book perspective, the Zero Trust Networks book, which came out in 2017, uh, is highly, highly regarded and uh, does a great job of talking about that. Uh, and then my book, which came out earlier this year, uh, from a you know, very vendor neutral perspective, talks about Zero Trust security and uh, how to look at it from an enterprise point of view. Uh, so with that, I know we're out of time, and I look forward to chatting with all of you in 
the uh, the after party, so to speak, in the in the uh, on the web platform. Thank you.